good afternoon. Thank you all for uh, coming. I'm Jason Delisle. I'm the director of the Federal Education Budget Project here at the New America Foundation. Um, Federal Education Budget Project is a nonpartisan authoritative source of information on federal education funding, uh, and our goal is to help heighten the quality of debate around education policy, particularly with the focus on federal funding. Um, many of you know that we have a blog, the Ed Money Watch blog. Um, you can check that out on our, on our website where we do uh, regular articles and uh, analysis on federal education funding. Um, we also have a website with a whole bunch of data on student achievement, funding, and demographics for every school district in the country and every institution of higher education in the country. Um, and we also publish research papers um, and convene panel discussions um, on important topics in education finance, which brings us to today's event. Um, over the past uh, about a year and a half, um, we've at the Federal Education Budget Project, we've been doing some work on uh, the federal stimulus funding um, under the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act with a lot of focus on the portion of that funding under the State Fiscal Stabilization Fund uh, that states use to fund their higher education systems. Uh, there was a lot of focus on K-12 funding. Um, a, lot of, a lot was said, a lot of research was done, a lot of, there was a lot of reporting on that side of it, but not really what we thought uh, wasn't enough on the higher education side. And so uh, we've been working on this series of papers. Um, and the last of the series, which came out uh, Late last year, some of these are out front. You can pick them up or you can get them off of our website. Uh, with a case study, a series of case studies on uh, those states that used um, a fair amount of the state fiscal stabilization fund um, to fund their higher education systems. Um, and the case study focused on uh, what they did with the funding and, and how they used it. Um, and a as we started to do some of that work, uh, most of it done by uh, Jennifer Cohen here at the Budget Project, um, we realized that you know, this funding was that funding was available for several several years, um, and the states that availed themselves of it um, are sort of now facing a, a funding cliff. Uh, and so, we thought it would be interesting to get a discussion going on what this sort of post-stimulus, uh, post-recession, but still very much so difficult budget times uh, world looks like for higher education finance. Um, and so that's the sort of focus today of, of our discussion. And um, I'd like to introduce first uh, Jenny Cohen here from the Budget Project. Uh, she's a senior policy analyst, and she manages our entire database and writes on our blog and writes issue briefs um, on federal education funding policy. Uh, she's going to, like I said, she's the author of these papers, um, and she's also going to moderate today's uh, panel discussion. But first, she's going to give you a little bit of some of the highlights of some of her the work that she's been doing in this area. Um, we also have Nick Johnson, uh, who is the Vice President for State Fiscal Policy at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, uh, Public Policy Institute here in DC. He directs the Center's State Fiscal uh, Project, which publishes reports on how state budget decisions affect families and communities. We have Dr. Paul Lingenfelter. He's the president of the State Higher Education Executive Officers, uh, SHEO, um, for those of you in the know. Uh, SHEO is a key source of expertise and information on state higher education funding and policy. Uh, and we also have um, Dr. Stephen Jordan, uh, who is the president of Metropolitan State College in Denver. Uh, under his leadership, the Met Metro State launched its first master's degree programs and experienced record enrollment growth. Uh, he has led nationally recognized efforts to reposition Metro State during challenging fiscal times, which makes him an ideal candidate for uh, today's discussion. So I'll uh, hand it off to Jennifer Cohen. Thank you, Jason. Uh, so I would first like to set the stage, tell you a little bit about the research we did and our conclusions uh, in order to more properly frame the discussion that our wonderful speakers here will lead us in. Uh, so let me tell you a brief story in the interest of keeping this as interesting as possible. On February 17th of 2009, President, President Barack Obama, oh, that probably is blocking my face, yes. Um, President Barack Obama signed the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act with the intention of helping to re-stimulate an economy that had gotten bogged down a little bit. 
Um, and in that bill, it included $100 billion in spending for education alone. This was a completely unprecedented unprecedented amount of money. Uh, the annual federal education budget is usually between 60 and 70 billion. So 100 billion in through one bill alone was huge and it was to be spent over three years, 2009, 2010, and 2011. Now, of course, there's lots of things included in that $100 billion, the largest of which was the State Fiscal Stabilization Fund, which provided $48.6 billion uh, to help states fill their budget gaps, and $39 billion of that was intended specifically for education. Now, everyone talked about what this money meant for K-12. You could open up the newspaper on any given day and see Colorado is spending its money on this in K-12 or Florida is spending its money on this in K-12, but almost no one talked about what this money meant for higher education. Now, to give you some details about the State Fiscal Stabilization Fund, um, effectively what it allowed and encouraged states to do was cut their education spending down to 2006 levels. So this was 2009, and they said, states, we're giving you open license to cut your spending down to 2006 levels. And you can use this money to fill that gap up to the higher of 2008 or 2009 levels. So it was giving license, quite literally, to the states to cut spending for higher education and fill those gaps with uh, the federal funds. Uh, the money was distributed, and this is important, based on population as opposed to based on fiscal need. So this meant that some states that weren't experiencing great recessions got money that they didn't necessarily need, and some states that were experiencing really significant, significant cuts uh, due to slowdown in revenues didn't get nearly enough to fill their gaps. Um, now, the money could be used for almost anything. They could use it for salaries and benefits. They could use it for... Um, new programs, anything like that, but they couldn't use it for new construction or for uh, construction for non-academic buildings. So they could use it, though, for improvements to instructional facilities, those sorts of things. The federal government put out a ton of guidance on the use of these funds, but there were two things that the federal government said were most important about the funds. They were to be used to save and create jobs, and they should not be used for ongoing expenses. Now, it should strike everyone in this room that those are two sort of contradictory statements because saving and creating jobs by paying salaries are inherently ongoing ex expenses. So from the get-go, states faced sort of a, a conundrum in how they were going to use the funds. So in order to draw more attention to what happened in higher education with the use of these funds, we embarked on what ended up being a three-part series. Now you'll see, if you collected some of the papers out there, it says part one of four and part two of four. We ended up combining parts three and four together. So uh, that is the whole set of papers, all three of them out there. Um, part three and four being what the case study states use the money for, and then part four being what happens next, and we combine them together. So just to assuage any confusion about that. So the first thing we did was look at how state spending for higher education shifted, both in dollar terms and as a proportion of total state spending. And what we found was pretty interesting. So what you're looking at here, and hopefully you can read the state's names here, is how much each state cut their higher education spending as a proportion of total state spending, so the percentage points that were cut um, in the year that they first implemented their state fiscal stabilization funds. So some states started using their state fiscal stabilization funds to fill gaps in higher education in 2009. So basically, as soon as they got the money, they started to use it. And that, on this graph, are the gray, the gray bars. And then some states decided not to start using the funds until 2010, and those are the blue bars. So we could see here that some states sort of did the opposite of what we expected. Um, those are... This is the, there we go, these states down here. So they actually increased their state spending as a proportion of total state spending, even though they had the state fiscal stabilization fund dollars. And obviously they did it to varying extents. Oklahoma is the state down here. And they increased between 2009 and 2010 their proportion of state spending on higher education by 2.5%. Then we have all these states up here that did exactly what we expected to see. They cut their state spending on higher education as a proportion of total state spending by varying amounts. And Nevada here, being the largest from what we saw, cut their state spending by more than three and a half percentage points in a given year. Now, we did also see some states that went sort of above and beyond what we expected. And those are the starred states here. We have Wyoming, Tennessee, West Virginia, Arkansas, New York, and Pennsylvania. They actually cut their state spending on higher education while increasing overall state spending. 
So they made a cut in higher education spending while increasing their total state spending overall. And those increases could have been in anything. It could have been in K-12. It could have been in Medicaid. Uh, that we weren't looking at specifically. But this is sort of the, the opposite. You'd expect them to be cutting state spending on higher education while also cutting overall state spending, because theoretically it's a contraction here. Uh, but we didn't necessarily see that. So the next thing that we looked at is how did states actually choose to divide their state fiscal stabilization funds between K-12 and higher ed? Now, it's important to know that this was made at a state-by-state -state basis, this choice. The state fiscal stabilization fund allowed states to decide that we will use this much of the money on K-12 in a given year and this much of the money on higher ed in a given year, given their own sort of legislative priorities uh, and what they saw fit to do with the funds. Now, most people expect that the vast majority of the money got spent on K-12, and that's absolutely right. We see $30.8 billion, it's a lot of money, over 2009, 10, and 11 got spent on K-12. But what few people realize is that more than $8 billion of that money was spent on higher ed. This is a huge investment in a given time period for federal funds in higher education. And so it makes you wonder, what happened with those dollars? Now, it is important to know that this was not an even distribution. Though, interestingly, so $8.3 billion is about 20% of the state fiscal stabilization fund, and that actually reflects the breakdown, more or less, for at a state by state overall, how they divide their state spending in education between higher ed and K-12. So usually it's they spend 70 to 80% of their funds on K-12 and 20 to 30% on higher ed. And so we see that pretty well reflected in this money here. But it's important also to know that some states spent all of their money on higher education, Colorado being a great example. They spent nearly all of their state fiscal stabilization funds on higher ed because their K-12 funds are constitutionally protected by the state, so they couldn't actually legally cut their K-12 spending. So they had to do it all in higher ed. And then some states spent almost all of their funds or all of their funds on K-12 because that's where their legislature decided to spend the funds. Um, but it is important to know that by virtue of spending the state fiscal stabilization funds on higher education, they were opening up their higher education system to cuts. That when they elected to use their state fiscal stabilization funds on higher ed, they pretty much said, as the federal law allowed them to, we're going to cut our state spending in this area. So, as Jason said, the final paper that we did was looking at eight different states to figure out exactly how they use the funds and what that meant for their institutions and then what it means in the future. So I just wanted to go through a couple of what I consider to be more interesting states uh, that we explored. So the first state here is Colorado. And what we're seeing in this graph is how, so the, the blue bar here is state general funds and the gray bar is the state fiscal stabilization funds that they used. So we're seeing here how the state cut their state spending in a given year and how they filled it with the state fiscal stabilization funds. Now what's important to know here is that this doesn't include tuition revenue. So if we'd included tuition revenue in this, you'd see a huge bar going up on each of these that includes tuition revenue. And over each of these years, Colorado increased their tuition significantly. In 2010 and 11, they increased their tuition by 9%, more or less across the board, um, although it was a institution by institution decision. And then in 2012, they're expecting to see increases between 10 and 15% at a lot of institutions. So you are seeing massive growth in tuition revenue at the same time. Now, what's interesting to see here is really just how much Colorado cut their spending. So in the first year that they implemented the state fiscal stabilization funds, they cut their state spending down to 555 billion, or million, excuse me. Um, and that is their 2006 spending level. So from the get-go, they went down to the very floor that they could go to, and they filled it with 151 million in state fiscal stabilization funds. So the first thing you're probably thinking is, well, then what gives in 2010? And what gives is that Colorado actually applied to a wa for a waiver to the Department of Education that basically said, we don't have enough tax revenue to spend even $555 million in 2010. We're going to need to cut our spending more and fill it all with the state fiscal stabilization funds. And the Department of Education said, go ahead and do it. It seemed like they didn't have any other options. But what that meant for 2011 was because they spent so much money in 2010, there wasn't enough in 2011 to fully fill the gap. So in 2011, their institutions took a greater hit because there wasn't enough federal funding available. Now, what is interesting about Colorado is that in 2010 and 2011, 
they spent their funds, they distributed their funds amongst institutions in a somewhat unusual way. So most states that we saw distributed their funds to their institutions based only on the proportion or share of state general funds. So if an institution got 20% of general funds in a given year, they'd get 20% of the state fiscal stabilization funds. Colorado probably looked at that and thought, well, that doesn't really cover all of the nuances of funding for higher education. So they approached it in a three-tiered way. They distributed 50% based on share of general funds, like all the other states. Uh, then they did 50% based on the share of total spending. And that total spending included tuition revenue. So it meant that institutions that had more tuition revenue than others would get a larger share of the funds. And then the last piece they did was they distributed a $10 million cut across their institutions based on enrollment growth. So meaning that institutions that faced more enrollment growth got a smaller share of the cut to help them accommodate for their growth in the number of students. Another interesting thing that happened in Colorado, and we see this in a few states, is that they had to shift direction mid-year. So in 2010, they were planning on spending slightly less than this in the state fiscal stabilization funds and then realized that they didn't have enough tax revenue. Even though they were already so far low, they were still short. And so they had to mid-year move some of the education stabilization funds intended for 2011 into 2012, causing also some trouble for their institutions who had to mid-year say, oh wait, you're changing our budgets and go back to the drawing board and figure that out again. The other state that I think is a little interesting um, is Louisiana. Now the first thing to know, note here about Louisiana is that this is their education stabilization funds that they spent in 2010 and 11, but you'll notice that they never were able to get up to their 2009 level. So this is a state where their state fiscal stabilization fund allocation did not, or was not at a sufficient enough amount level to get them up to their spending. Now it is possible that this was a choice made by the state legislature, that they did have enough funds to get them there, but instead they decided to put those funds in K-12. So the important thing to remember as we're talking about all this is that there's a lot of decision making that happened at the state legislature and also in state governor's offices that influenced some of these outcomes. So this isn't they didn't plug and chug into a, a formula to get these distributions. It was decisions that were made. And so they're not always the most rational decisions, as we know. Now, the other thing that happened in Louisiana was a little bit of budget manipulation. So in 2011, the legislature realized that they didn't have enough money to reach their maintenance of effort. So that's their 2006 level of spending, the floor that they could spend for state funding. And so they said, oh, we know what we'll do. We'll take money promised for 2012, so that was state funding that was supposed to go here, and shift it into our 2011 budget. And the way they got around that is that they did a 10% tuition increase in 2011, and they just plopped that increased tuition revenue into 2012. So in the end, the actual amount of money available in 2011 didn't change. It was just the source of the funds was switched around from being tuition revenue to being state revenue. And you see these sorts of manipulations having, happening in a lot of states that the maintenance of effort provision was something the Department of Education took very seriously. So states had to get a little creative sometimes in finding ways to make that, to reach that maintenance of effort provision. And you see that in Louisiana here. Another interesting thing that Louisiana did, which is worth mentioning, is their legislature implemented the GRAD Act, which is the Granting Resources and Autonomy for Diplomas Act. What the GRAD Act essentially allowed institutions to do is if they reached certain metrics, graduation rates, retention rates, those sorts of things, certain outcomes, they were then awarded the ability to increase their tuition as they saw fit. So in each of these years, we see Louisiana institutions raising their tuition by between eight and 10% in a given year. And that's actually, you'd see, as I mentioned before in Colorado, huge bars going up here for tuition revenue in each year, and each year it's growing by 10% in addition. So we're seeing these states are also really filling their gaps through tuition revenue. So then the question remains, how did the institutions actually use their funds? And we identified five major ways that they use them. The most common being, and I mentioned this before, salaries and benefits. So some states actually required that their institutions use the money only for salary and benefits. They said, here's your amount, plug it into your, um, into your salary and benefit account line, and that's it, you're done. And the reason they did that is, sort of interesting, I think, unintended consequences of federal guidance. When the federal government said you need to use the money to save and create jobs, 
The state said, great, that's easy. It's also very easy to track. And one of the things I'm sure you've heard about the American Recovery Investment Act is that it's one of the most closely examined distributions of federal funds ever. Every quarter, states and institutions, school districts, everyone had to report to the federal government how much money they received, what they used it for, all of those things. And when you just plug in chugs a new funding stream into your salary and benefits calculator, it's really easy to track. It just appears there in your spreadsheet. Doing other things are a little more complicated to, to track and also didn't fall under that um, umbrella of saving and creating jobs. But we did see some other uses as well. So for example, Louisiana allowed their institutions to determine the proportion of funds they would spend between salaries and benefits and need-based aid. So you do see some institutions, oop, sorry about that, some institutions um, that have a access mission using more of their funds for need-based aid to help more students attend. Um, that happened in Louisiana and also in Massachusetts, some of their institutions used it for need-based aid. Uh, we also see capital improvements. So as I mentioned before, they couldn't use the money to build new buildings or to build football stadiums or swimming pools or what have you. But some places did use the funds for capital improvements and investments. So for example, Salem State in Massachusetts used the funds uh, to improve facilities, especially to make them more energy efficient, thinking that these of investments now would save the money over the long term. We also saw this in Wyoming. Wyoming actually divided their funds into two different pieces, uh, and the vast majority of the funds had to be used for capital improvements. So you see a lot of their institutions using it to update and renovate instructional facilities like new hoods and chem labs, new floors and hygiene facilities, those sorts of things. Um, we also see investments in technology, and this is another one of those paying it forward. If you invest the money now, you can save money later. Uh, so we saw this also in Salem State in Massachusetts. They digitized their records. They brought in more library acquisitions that were digital so that they could save money in the long term. And then we also see delay in tuition increases. Now, these were either indirect or very direct. So for example, the University of Massachusetts, before they knew they were getting the state fiscal stabilization funds, implemented a $1,500 tuition or fee increase, actually. A tuition in the the state of Massachusetts has been more or less the same since the 70s, so instead they increased fees. Um, so they implemented a $1,500 fee increase, and then when they realized they got the funds, they rebated their students $1,100 of that fee increase, but only in-state students. Um, another thing you see here very frequently is that out-of-state students more and more are shouldering the burden of costs because they're not as protected typically by the legislature for tuition. But overall, we see that all of these expenditures more or less led to delays in tuition increases indirectly. So for example, if they hadn't gotten the funds for salaries and benefits, they would have had to raise tuition more than you see. So for example, in North Carolina, you see 10 to 15% tuition increases over the implementation of the State Fiscal Stabilization Fund. But folks there told us if they hadn't gotten the funds, they might have had to raise tuition as much as 25%. So we are seeing that the situation would have been much more dire for students. And moving forward, now that the funds are no longer available, they definitely will be. The other thing that you would have seen um, is huge cuts. So many institutions, even as it were, did, uh, had to cut unpopular programs, lay off staff, things like that, and those sorts of decisions would be much more broad. This is all under the assumption that absent the federal funds, the legislatures would have made the same decisions that they made. So they would have cut state spending the, the same way that they had with the funds. However, a lot of folks believe that legislatures would have made different decisions if the federal funds hadn't been available. So this is, we're living in a very specific world, a world where the decisions that were made were the decisions that were made, and it's very difficult to hypothesize what, have, what would have happened absent those decisions. So next question, and why we have our wonderful speakers here, is to tell us what happens next. Um, so I would like to welcome up Nick, Nick Johnson from the Center on Budget um, Pri Policy Priorities, excuse me, uh, to tell us a bit about uh, what he sees in the future for state revenues and expenditures. Thanks. Do you notice that we're not sitting up here, but each of our water bottles has a nameplate? <laughs> so uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Really pleased to be with you all. So I'm going to start by giving a little bit of context to some of the things that just slides. Uh, a little bit of context to some of the stuff that Jennifer's been talking about, um, and then talk a little bit about what may be coming next. And of course, the short answer to what is coming next is I don't know, and none of us knows. But we'll we can maybe make some informed guesses in part, 
by thinking about the context of the, of the last few years. So um, I'm going to talk about the the context of, in the in the sense of where does higher education funding fit in the context of state budgets, um, and what's been going on over the last few years to uh, the other determinants of, of state spending. Uh, and then switch to talk a little bit about the road ahead. Uh, and, and as most of you probably know, um, most of the state budget goes to education and health care. Um, uh, the biggest single slice of state general fund spending, this is state tax dollars only, not including what states get from the federal government, uh, is K through 12 education, uh, followed by Medicaid and then higher education behind behind that, and all other includes everything from uh, aid to local aid to lo localities, uh, pensions for public employees, economic development, parks and rec, environmental protection, and so on, uh, and and. Uh, and um, so if you look at state, state and local together, which I'm, I'm not showing you here, but state and local spending together, education, health care, transportation, public safety, represents about 80% of state and local budgets together. Uh, and it's important to think about that because then when the recession hit, starting 2007, 2008, state revenues start declining. Uh, declines of, on average over 10% in state revenues from pre-recession levels by the time by the time they bottomed out. Um, uh, the answer to the question of what did states cut in order to continue to balance their budgets? Every state uh, has a balanced budget requirement of some sort. What did they cut in order to, to balance their budget? The answer is you got to look at the whole pie, and that's what states did. They looked at, 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 at everything, and certainly higher education took a share of the hit, as we'll discuss in a moment. Um, so going forward then, I think the question is, when, if the recession caused such a big loss of state funding, um, will the end of the recession, will the economy's emergence, will the fact that revenues are starting to come back a bit at the state level lead to a restoration of state funding? So if we have the federal dollars, which Jennifer talked about, plug in the gap in the middle, are we going to get back to where we were before? So that's what I'm going to talk about for a little bit. Um, this year, the fiscal year we're in, has been the worst year for state budgets probably ever. When state legislatures were writing their budgets last year, here's what they were looking at. They were looking at revenues that were still way below pre-recession levels. They were looking at, um, at the fact that their reserve funds had mostly been spent. They were looking at the fact that the Recovery Act dollars uh, uh, not just the uh, education, the state fiscal stabilization fund dollars administered by the Department of Education, but also $90 billion in additional Medicaid funding had expired. They were looking at the fact that Medicaid case rolls, uh, case loads and, and participation in other public programs was still high because of high levels of joblessness. So very tough, very large continued gaps between uh, the cost of services and the need for services and the amount of revenues that was available. So you're looking at fiscal year 20, uh, 2012, the year we're in, when they were writing the budgets for this current year, uh, 42 states with large budget shortfalls, and some of them very big, over 20% budget gaps, which, which essentially means if you're going to close that size of a gap with cuts alone, uh, that's on average, every program takes a hit of over 20%. Looking ahead a little bit, it gets a little better. As we go into 2013, the budgets that, uh, that legislatures are looking at right now only 29 states are facing budget shortfalls. And honestly, these, some of these are states with two-year budgets where they were, where they closed, they, last year when they were writing their budgets, they simultaneously closed their gap for 2012 and for 2013. So we're, this is a little bit of a look back and a little bit of a look forward. Um, and so it, things are getting better. Revenues are definitely starting to tick up. We are now merely 6% below pre-recession levels in terms of overall state tax tax revenues, which is a lot better than being 12% below pre-recession levels. That's just adjusted for inflation. I'm not adjusting for anything else like the fact that there are hundreds of thousands more kids in K through 12 needing education, hundreds of thousands of more college students in, in public colleges and universities, millions of more people on Medicaid, and so on. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. It's just more depressing stuff. You don't really need it. <laughs> 
Uh, so this is, so we looked back at fiscal year 2012 and really tried to dissect, if you look at all the states, how did they close those budget gaps, which is a much harder exercise than you would think because the data, you know, it's the say, if, if you've seen one state budget, you've seen one state budget. They are not very easy to compare uh, and certainly the decisions that they make are very easy to compare, which I think tells you something about the challenge that, that Jennifer faced in, in writing this report. Um, um, so in 2012, which is when there was a lot of state fiscal stabilization money, there was the Medicaid money from the Recovery Act available, that federal assistance, that emergency federal assistance, you can't, so it, it, the black lettering and the blue uh, slice of the pie is sort of sliding in together, but I'll tell you it says the blue slice is federal assistance, about a third of state budget gaps that year were closed thanks to the Recovery Act. The balance of the gap was closed by, mostly by spending cuts uh, and to a lesser extent by taxes and fees. Uh, raising, uh, I'll talk more about those in just a second, uh, and to, uh, to a limited extent other, which includes everything from drawing down rainy fun day funds to uh, plain old budgeting and accounting gimmicks. Um, the, um, the budget cuts, as I said, hit every slice of the pie. Um, healthcare. States cut back access to Medicaid benefits. They trimmed eligibility for, for Medicaid services uh, and providers, healthcare providers, hospitals, doctors took very big hits in their reimbursement rates. Uh, budget cuts hit seniors and people with dis dis programs for seniors and people with disabilities. They hit K through 12 schools greatly. We've seen a majority of states still last year were spending less per pupil adjusted for inflation than they were before the recession. Uh, and uh, the, 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 blue num the, the red numbers at the bottom, 30 states uh, did identifiable health care cuts that we could find, 25 states uh, made cuts in programs for seniors and people with disabilities, 30 states uh, cut K through 12. This is just, this is not including the cuts in this year. This is a survey we did last summer um, looking backwards from there. The two biggest areas of hits were uh, to college and universities, the f most widespread kinds of cuts cutting funding for colleges and universities, and uh, cutting funding for um, state employees. So freezing pay, doing layoffs, cutting pension benefits, cutting retiree health, and so on. Um, all these state budget cuts have one other implication that's relevant, to, I think, to the, the topic Jennifer talked about, which was the impact on the macroeconomy, right? Uh, the last year, to calendar year 2011, State purchases, state and local purchases of goods and services in the national economy declined by a greater level than in any year since 1944. That's a direct bite out of overall gross domestic product. So a, very, a slowing effect on the growth of GDP. Since August 2008, state and local governments on that have cut a total of 650,000 jobs and are continuing to do so at a clip of 10, 15,000 jobs per month according to the, the BLS data that comes out every month. So even as private sector em employment is starting to, you know, starting to grow, you're seeing it uh, uh, eaten away a little bit um, by continuing cuts of the state and local sector, which has a ripple effect on the economy and is, and is slowing the recovery. Um, uh, the reason I mentioned that, I'm going to skip this one for a second, uh, is that, again, the role of the Recovery Act then was to slow those cuts, to fill in for those cuts so they didn't have as big an effect on GDP, big effect on employment. And uh, this is from the new CBO report looking at the macroeconomic impact of the Recovery Act saying that on the whole it saved two, two million, um, uh, over, over two million jobs. Um, the, the blue line is what un the unemployment rate actually was, uh, and the yellow and, uh, um, and red lines are the range of estimates from different macroeconomic forecasters about what it would have been uh, had the Recovery Act not been, not been enacted. And, and a, a survey of economists done the, by major economists done by the University of Chicago found widespread agreement that, yes, the Recovery Act had a positive effect on the, on the macroeconomy. And a big part of what the way that worked was filling in these state uh, budget gaps, uh, preventing the depth of cuts um, in higher education, in K through 12, in health care, and everything else that otherwise would have been necessary. So let me mention one other thing that states can do to balance their budgets, which is to raise taxes and fees. We looked at, uh, at, at taxes and sort of tax-like fees, so motor vehicle fees. We didn't look at higher, I mean, we, looked, we, 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 we looked at higher education tuition increases, but we think about that separately. That's, I think that is more of a budget cut. Um, 
um, although it, you know, from a family's perspective, it has much of the same impact. Um, about 10 states did pretty big tax packages, but a lot of those were temporary. California, New York, Maryland, New Jersey, that are, that are now expiring. So the, there was important revenue gains from, from taxes, but that's now expiring. A lot of other states did smaller things, either on the tax side or, on, or more in fees, pretty widespread. Um, given the political changes in the elections of uh, 2010, and particularly and then, uh, in, in uh, Virginia and, and uh, Mississippi last year, uh, the, the, uh, the record number of Republican legislators elected um, and, and, and uh, a lot of new governors coming in, a lot of them basically taking no tax pledges, the number of tax and fee increases has gone down. So that's another source of pressure on state budgets. So as we look ahead, um, there are a number of sources of pressures on state budgets um, that will continue even as the economy rubbers. Uh, they still, pension funds are still underfunded. Um, uh, there's big, those big budget gaps still have to be filled and a lot of the th bad things that states did in their budgets have to be undone at great cost. We estimate that it'll take a number of years before states even get back to pre-recession levels. Uh, and then states are still saddled with tax systems that are widely criticized for being too narrow sales tax bases that are levied on services, not goods, that don't take into account the internet-based uh, uh, sales. So a lot of challenges remain for state, state budgets, and I think the question that we have to ask is, are we going to see restoration? Are we going to see, see, see sort of retrenchment back down to that, these, you know, we stay stuck in these essentially recessionary levels of funding for state services? So on the plus side, um, is the fact that the public is not happy about what has happened over the last few years. I mean, they're not happy about a lot of things. They're not happy about what the banks did. They're not happy, um, um, uh, and they're very not happy about what state and local governments have done in terms of cutting the services um, that they know are important to the long-term success of their communities. So, um, and policymakers are listening. So I'm gonna pick on Governor Rick Scott from Florida for a minute. Um, uh, but he's not alone. A lot of governors who came in with sort of a cut spending uh, a mantra this year in their state of the stage address were a lot softer. Here he's talking about K through 12 education and actually posing with a school teacher. But I think the same basic concept applies in any area. Floridians truly believe that support for education is the most significant thing we can do to ensure both short-term both short-term job growth and long-term economic prosperity for our state. Uh, and, he, and he had this, this, uh, uh, this school teacher up in the, up in the gallery. Um, so that's what he said in his State of the State address. But then the question is, what did he do in the budget he introduced? Um, well, after years of budget cuts at Florida that had cut an amount that had cut about over $1,300 uh, per pupil in funding for K through 12 schools, he restored $59 per pupil. In, in funding, it totals about a billion dollars, and he took that out of the Medicaid budget um, while also proposing a whole series of tax cuts. And so, on the, you know, while we're seeing positive stuff out of the rhetoric, we're seeing negatives out of, uh, in the actual dollars. And so I don't, you know, that's, that's the question, is which way is it gonna go? We're still gonna see sort of very, very slow restoration of the funding that doesn't keep up with the overall growth of the economy or the, the, the needs, or are we gonna see something um, that's more in keeping with, honestly, where the, I think the public mood is. A um, couple of other threats, I think. One is tax cuts continue to, I mean, it's sort of amazing to think, right? I mean, we are, tax revenues, are, as I said, are still 6% below pre-recession levels, and, um, uh, um, you know, a slow growth forecast, and yet a number of governors are proposing major tax cuts. And when I say major cut tax cuts, I mean things like repealing the personal income tax entirely in both Kansas and Oklahoma. That's what's on the table. Well, they do it over time, but still, that's 40 to 50 percent of those states' general fund budgets. Um, uh, and so, it, I mean, it's just striking to see how many states want to use any new revenues to pay first for tax cuts, and then anything else comes after that. Um, and, and you know, as the economy recovers, the number of states that are at least considering cutting taxes are going to rise, and that's every dollar in tax cuts comes out of something. Um, and the other is um, another major threat at the state level is that states are considering going a step further, not just cutting taxes, but then enacting constitutional or other ballot measures that lock in depressed levels of spending, um, uh, capping the growth of state revenue so that you're essentially at uh, uh, pre-recession levels and then you're allowed only very slow levels of revenue growth that isn't enough to keep up with 
increasing numbers of college students, increasing numbers of, of K through 12 students, rising health care costs. Um, uh, that's on the ballot in Florida in November. It's in a number of other states. Uh, uh, it takes a, a variety of different forms. It's, it's modeled, uh, uh, as the next two speakers know all too well, on, on what Colorado had for a number of years, the so-called Tabor limit, which was a, a very restrictive cap on spending. Um, if enacted, that this, you know, these measures would cause another challenge for the ability of states to finance higher ed, um, um, because they're going to go to higher ed before they go honestly to K cut a K through 12 uh, and cutting um, uh, mandated health care spending and so on. A po the final policy threat, and then I'll wrap up, is um, the f what's going to happen at the federal level. Um, I think I'll probably a lot of people in the room, the next few speakers can speak more about this, might have to do with cuts to federal aid for higher education. But remember that what the federal government, one of the big things that the federal government does is run programs through state governments. About a third of the category of federal spending, known as non-defense discretionary spending, is in fact aid to states and localities. And that's the category of spending that has already been cut as a result of the budget deal enacted last year and will be cut much, much further if the so-called sequestration cuts take effect as they are scheduled to do next January. This is all going to be part of the, the big budget deals uh, uh, and debates that are going to come down the road next fall and in the lame duck session and early next, next year. But if broadly aid to states is cut, States then will have to make decisions, as they did with the Recovery Act. What do we do about the loss of federal dollars? Do we find somewhere else in our budget, own budget to cut to fill in for the loss of federal dollars? So let's just say, for instance, that the federal government cut the WIC program. A state um, government might have to decide, does it use its own dollars to fill in for the loss of federal funding to avoid cutting uh, nutrition assistance to uh, uh, pregnant women and children, or does it go somewhere else in its budget? Um, so these, you know, the, the, the federal pressures will filter through to, uh, to save for higher ed in one way or another. So it's been a challenging next few years. Things are definitely looking up. I was told that my slides didn't betray very much optimism about the future. I mean, look, you know, there's no way to say it. The, the economy is looking up. Um, um, but I think we face some, honestly, some political threats that will um, really shape uh, higher education funding into the future. So uh, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much. And I'll pick up mine. Thank you, Nick, and thank you, Jennifer, for, for this opportunity. Uh, I'm going to run through uh, a lot of facts fairly quickly and try to wrap up with uh, uh, some interpretation and comment on what some of the policy issues are. Uh, first of all, here's a picture of state spending uh, for a period of about 22 years. And you can see that this is uh, unadjusted for inflation. It grew a lot, and just about everything grew except public assistance. This is not doing anything. There we go. I'll try a different button. Uh, this is the share of uh, state general fu fund expenditures to different functions. And uh, if you look at the numbers quickly, it's pretty clear that the only thing that's grown significantly is Medicaid which went from about 8% to almost 16% of state funding in a period of 19 years. Uh, higher education funding as a percentage of state budget went down. Uh, K-12 went up some. Uh, public assistance went down quite a lot. This is a projection of um, state and local budget deficits done by Don Boyd of the Rockefeller Institute. And it was actually done in about 2005, sort of pre-recession. And what this illustrates is the fundamental structural deficit driven by uh, increases in health care costs, uh, the inelasticity of state revenue streams, and growing demands for uh, elementary and secondary and higher education, primarily. Uh, it's not a pretty picture. Uh, the national average uh, structural deficit, according to Boyd's analysis, is 5.7 percent. 
Now I want to turn to the higher education picture. And this is a 25-year view of state funding for higher education uh, based on our annual state higher education finance study. Uh, this is uh, 2010 data. Fiscal 2011 data will be available in about two weeks. And I'll give you a hint of what that uh, what that'll look like. I want to take a minute on this because uh, it's pretty simple but also a little complex. This line is enrollment growth. And it went from about uh, 7 uh, million students, full-time equivalent, to about 11 and a half million in that 25-year period. The fastest growth rate in enrollment in a decade that we've seen since 1960 occurred in the last 10 years. Uh, so the demand for higher education is substantial. The blue bars are state support per student in constant dollars. And the typical pattern has been uh, for state support to decline when there's a recession, which is what we had right here, and to decline when there's a recession, which we had right here, but then to recover as there's, as there's a recovery. And the other thing that I think you just got to remember, this enrollment growth was pretty constant during the whole period of time. So the early 2001-2002 uh, recession saw very rapid enrollment growth, substantial decline in, in state funding per student in constant dollars. Although the interesting thing is in, in unadjusted dollars, it stayed at about 70, 70 billion all three of these years. Didn't go down, but it just couldn't keep peace, pace with that enrollment growth. Then we had a recovery. Uh, in 2008, state support was actually at $85 billion, $86 billion, public institution, which is quite a bit higher than it was here when it was $70 billion. And then we got the recession of 2008. And we see here that enrollments continued to grow and substantial decline in, uh, in state support per student. Um, I got to add that these numbers include the stimulus funds. But in the grand scheme of things, if you add uh, tuition and the state funding together, in 1985, we had about $140 billion. So if you take $40 billion of stimulus and you spread it over three years, uh, you're talking real money, but you're not talking about material money in this, this big, big picture scenario. Uh, and the other thing to notice is this is constant dollar tuition per FTE student. And over this period of time, uh, constant dollar tuition revenues per FTE student went from about $2,300 to $4,300. Uh, if you look at, did I lose a slide? No, I didn't, I guess. Um, the other thing I think is important to understand is the enormous diversity among the states in, in funding for higher education. Uh, this shows uh, for a single year, adjusted for cost of living differences among the states and also adjusted for a variation in the enrollment mix, uh, what the funding was uh, uh, per student. And you see it goes all the way from uh, oh, probably about $17,000, $18,000 in Alaska down to, whoops, down to uh, about 8000 in California. The other thing that's interesting is the, uh, the red uh, is tuition revenue, and the blue is state revenue. And you can see the enormous variation in the states in the amount of the higher education budget that comes from tuition. Uh, change from 2005 to 2010, uh, this is the variation among the states. So whenever you generalize about higher education funding in the United States, uh, you're distorting the picture. You just can't generalize. There's a lot of diversity. Here's the one I was looking for. This is the secular trend in uh, the shift of the burden from uh, the public sources to students and their parents in, in finance for higher education. When you add together state support and net tuition revenues in 1985, uh, tuition was about 23 percent. Uh, 2010, it's 40.3 uh, percent. And this is recession. We have a recession, enrollment growth, tuition goes up, recovery, enrollment growth, tuition goes up, 
recovery, another recession, the mother of all recessions. We have another year like this. Uh, this is another picture of the variation among uh, the states in uh, intuition revenue as a fraction of the total ed educational spending. We've got New Hampshire and Vermont over here where it's more than 70 percent. Uh, Wyoming, New Mexico down here, national average of 40 percent. Now I want to shift to some other, I think, relevant indicators. This is state need-based and non-need-based grant aid for undergraduate students. And the period, this is in, in constant dollars, uh, the period is 1999-2000 uh, to 2009. Substantial growth in total aid per FTE student in response certainly to those tuition increases and uh, a substantial, even larger growth in non-need-based aid, but it's still a smaller fraction of the total. Uh, this is uh, state aid per FTE student, uh, and this is a little deceptive because institutional aid is not in these numbers, but this is state-based programs, and you'll see a couple of states here where it's just enormous. Georgia, this is the Hope Scholarship Program. Uh, where it's this huge, it's almost always a, a merit-based scholarship program. Uh, Georgia, South Carolina, Tennessee, Wyoming are kind of a blend. And then you have a group of states that have pretty substantial need-based aid programs and a lot of states that don't have much, although there's institutional aid in some of those states. Uh, this is a picture of uh, public and non-public aid uh, per hundred dollars of state support. In simpler language, um, this means that 10 percent of the state budget went to student aid, okay? And this is the trend line from 2001 to 2010. So for the nation as a whole, it went from about 8 percent uh, to student aid to about 11 percent of the total state budget went into student aid. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is that the, the lighter colored bar is the fraction of state aid that went to independent institutions. And uh, some people don't recognize that the states are supporting private higher education. Uh, they certainly are. The other thing I think that is significant is in the last few years that fraction of the state budget has declined uh, as uh, there's been more pressure on public tuitions. Here's federal student aid per FTE in constant $2,009. Uh, the big story here is the growth of the loan program and uh, that's really material. Uh, these are tuition tax credits. Uh, this is Pell Grants in, in constant dollars, and you can see there's uh, material growth there, and the other the other federal programs. Uh, this is the big budget problem in the federal government. Uh, this is uh, Pell Grant expenditures. Uh, this is the maximum Pell Grant. You see the decline in constant dollars and then the recovery. Uh, this is the average Pell Grant per recipient, and this is the number of Pell recipients. Now that line doesn't look, uh, well, it's growing, but it's, this one will make you, give you a sense of how dramatically it's growing. Uh, this is the fall enrollment line, this blue line. This is the number of Pell recipients, this red line. And this is the percentage of fall enrollment that is Pell recipients. So we have an enormous growth of uh, Pell recipients as a fraction of, of total enrollment. And there are a lot of things driving that, some of which are really good public policy issues and some of which are not. And uh, we can get into what I would speculate some of the not could be. Uh, but we have some serious issues in the way we allocate uh, resources for student aid. Now this is, this is one of the, the policy issues that I think we really need to focus the country on. Uh, this is a, an analysis pulled together by Tony Carnevale uh, based on the uh, uh, longitudinal study of, of students in America. The bottom axis is a functional equivalent SAT score. And these bars are uh, socioeconomic status. And the relationship between high socioeconomic status and degree completion 
is almost unbrokenly consistent at every level. Uh, the part of this chart that I like to focus on is this one right here. Uh, at 1,000 to uh, 1,100 SAT equivalent, that's one standard deviation above average. You know, this is the fat part of the distribution in our country in terms of academic aptitude. And at that level, if you're in the top quartile socioeconomic status, by the time you're 28 years old, you've got a bachelor's degree 65% of the time. If you're at that level of ability and you're bottom SES, it's a 15% degree completion ratio for a bachelor's degree. And this is uh, an enormous waste of human talent as well as an issue of social justice. In the current year, when we get our um, um, budget or our, our report, we'll see that state support with uh, the final little bit of uh, stimulus fund help. One minute, great. I didn't see over there till now. Glad I'm not that far out of the line. Uh, enrollments grow, grew in mostly everywhere in the country. I, as I recall, the number will be about 2.5% up. Uh, but because of the flatness in state support, you're going to have tuition increases and you're going to have uh, uh, a decline in, in the total spending per student. Uh, in one state, and I'm not going to say which state just now, there's a pretty dramatic decrease in enrollments. And I think that is related to fiscal constraint as well as, as tuition increases, where institutions just saying, you know, we cannot admit the students who want to come. Uh, tuition continues to grow and support per student will drop again. Fiscal 12, uh, state support was down 7.6 percent. These numbers are already known. Uh, Nick sort of pointed out how miserable the current budget year has been. Uh, the thing that was remarkable to me in fiscal 11 actually states replaced more uh, stimulus funds money than, than not to keep the total funding. Fiscal 12, they did not do that, and I don't know all the reasons. Enrollments, we don't know. We won't know for a year. We'll find out, though. And tuition, I'm sure it's going to go up, but we don't know. So uh, it supports per student. It's going to go down. It's probably going to be the ugliest year we've seen yet. So uh, I'm going to wrap up. Three wrong ideas about higher education funding. If we come up with the right formula, we'll know how much to spend and it'll provide all the incentives and we're going to get great performance. Uh, second wrong idea is the only way to get improved performance is to spend more money. Uh, that's, that's a myth that we can't tolerate anymore. And the second wrong idea is we can get the results we need without spending more money. Uh, given the enrollment demand and the need of the society for higher education funding, uh, we're going to have to find a way to invest what it's going to take. These are the questions I would suggest substituting. What does the public need? Uh, what can higher education do better with the resources they have now? And Steve Jordan will tell you some of those things. And finally, uh, where can we make strategic investments that will really help us uh, meet the need? So thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Left beautiful Colorado yesterday. The winds were blowing about 80 miles an hour, so we flew in here pretty easily. You know, it's really interesting to be from Colorado and to know that we've already added two terms to the lexicon of higher education uh, fiscal policy. The first is tabering. You all know tabering. That's the limitations that go uh, in state constitutions. And the second, although you didn't realize it, its sister term is Tebowing, which is presidents <laughs> praying for a change in the fiscal situation. <laughs> So I'm, I'm here to give you uh, some examples of, of that, those institutions that may have done it a little bit differently, because you've heard that, that most of the institutions, and certainly all of my colleagues in Colorado used the, um, t uh, the ARA money to simply um, replace the uh, general fund support that had been going to salaries, and they used it up until it, it disappeared. Uh, and we were a slightly different example of, of what to do. And, and I will say it was very strategic um, and, and intentionally strategic on our part. And one of the reasons why is much of the data that you've seen up here, what's interesting about looking at the lines is that um, every time you look at one of those lines about the average of state support per student or overall state support, 
is that uh, in every case there are institutions that are above and below the line. And typically, and, and I, I'm going to be speaking for those who are below the line. And in talking about being uh, one of those institutions that's below the line, I'm also going to say that predominantly those are the institutions that are dealing with the very populations that the president and our state have said are so critical to get into and out of our institutions of higher education, which is our, our students of color. Uh, and so what I hope will come out at the end is um, some insights into what I think are real disconnects between our stated public policies and the instruments that we are using to achieve those policies. So our institution, like any other, is committed to quality and value. And certainly in these very uncertain fiscal times, um, it has caused us to have to take a look at what we are doing and how we are using our resources to maximize our ability to execute our mission. We're a regional comprehensive institution. 97% um, of our students come from the seven county excuse me, 97% of our students come from Colorado, 91% from the seven county metropolitan area. And when you think about the fact that there are 40 public institutions in Colorado, two year and four year, um, we have 20% of all the Colorado vet resident baccalaureate students. So one fifth of all Coloradans uh, going for a baccalaureate degree come to our college. And we have 10% of all the Colorado residents across all 40 institutions. So um, uh, we have a, um, we clearly are a place uh, which Coloradans look to. And what I'm going to talk about are the right sizing, what we term right sizing efforts, um, which have made some national news on what we think was a unique approach to our budget reductions. Um, Jennifer spoke to the, the way Colorado applied it and, and how we initially adjusted to the federal requirement of 0506. Um, which for us was a $10 million reduction. She then talked about the additional, uh, we went in for a waiver as a state, and the formula that went into determining all of that. You know, it, it was interesting, and I appreciate Paul talking about formulas, because um, that formula, which had all these intricate components on it, was quite frankly, Scarlett, who gives a damn? Because the requirement was that at the end of the time period, they had to have it back to 0506 anyway. So they, they create this, this intricate formula to do additional reductions to it when they knew everybody was going to have to go back to 0506. So we took the position from the get-go, based upon everything we knew about conditions in Colorado and projections for the future, that things were not going to get better. That we were going to lose, we were going to lose the amount of the reduction down to 0506, and the likelihood would be that we would take further reductions um, after the stimulus process was over. And so we chose to eliminate um, our share of the, of the reductions, which was about a 20% reduction in our state support uh, all at one time. And we just, you know, right at the beginning, just said we're going to reduce it. And we're going to use the ARA funds to figure out how we can do things differently, how we can either use the ARA funds to generate more revenue for the college, how we can use the ARA funds perhaps to um, become more efficient and to substitute technology for labor, um, and how we might use them to make some at least minor shifts between the seniority of our faculty and, 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 and put aside some senior faculty, bring in junior faculty, and yet do it in a way in which we honor those senior faculty by giving them the opportunity to leave a legacy which we called a capstone project. And I think I'm going to need to do this myself, aren't I? Here we go. So, three, we had three initiatives, revenue generating, right sizing, and capstone. So revenue generating projects. We were, um, at the time we entered this process, the single largest baccalaureate institution in the country that did not, in fact, we were the only baccalaureate institution in the country of 15,000 or more students who did not offer graduate programs. And we had made a determination as a result of our initiatives around an attempt to become a Hispanic serving institution that we needed to get into uh, master's level programs. Um, and having visited HSIs, what we heard consistently from those HSIs is that having undergraduate Latino students in an upper division course with a graduate student 
created positive role models and encouraged those students to persist to graduation and maybe move on to get a master's degree. So we'd made the determination that we were going to move into master's programs right at the time that this happened. And everyone said to us, my God, how can you, how can you implement graduate programs while you're cutting the budget? And we made a decision that we could do it by making our graduate programs, unlike the research universities where, where they use the lower division and, uh, courses to cross-subsidize the graduate programs, we were going to make our graduate programs 100% self-support and create a model in which they would generate a positive cash flow and subsidize our undergraduate programs. We've implemented three graduate programs in teacher education, in accountancy, and in social work. Uh, we are finishing our second year, um, and, um, and we are at the point where we have, this year we'll break even, and we project next year we will make somewhere in the neighborhood of $300,000 in profit on three graduate programs that we will use to uh, subsidize undergraduate students. The ARA funds were used to pay for the time for faculty to develop the curriculum and to, to develop the business models that would help us to generate that revenue. The second concept was right-sizing with technology. You know, there was a, there's some great um, academic work that was done in the early 1970s when higher education went through a significant downturn in enrollment, not caused by fiscal reasons, but, but caused by changes in demographics. And uh, there was a lot of work done on cutback management and fiscal stress in higher ed. And that literature, when you read it, um, at the end it points out that there was no substitute for labor when all these reductions occurred. And its conclusion was that the reason there was no substitute of technology for labor was there was no revenue source. Well, here we are now with all this ARA money coming in. We have a limited time period in which we could use it. And so we made a decision that we would use 3.7 million of our RF uh, stimulus money to do right-sizing projects, to do projects that would allow us to become more efficient or which would help us to generate more revenue so that when the money went away, the people who were left would be more productive, even though it would be a smaller workforce base. So again, we did a lot of, we, did, we started off and we had 30 projects we started with. Um, over time, we moved it up to 51 projects. We've completed 47 of the 51 projects. And they run the gamut from, um, from projects like um, digitizing all our records. So that, for example, when we started off, most of our, most of our uh, records uh, on uh, transcripts from the, um, years gone by were still um, paper records. Some of them uh, actually housed in a cave at Lookout Mountain uh, for protection. And so it could take uh, one student services person as long as a day to generate a transcript. By digitizing, we've reduced that down to three minutes. Now think about the savings you get in workload on individuals when you take a one person and change it from a one-day project to a three-minute project. Uh, we used it to upgrade all of our records that related to grants uh, contracting processes and to um, our foundation so that we could use those as ways to generate more revenue from alumni and to uh, improve the ability of our faculty uh, to do the grants processes. Um, and so we view this as a very significant and successful effort, and our board has said um, that they have charged me now to go and look at uh, longer-term projects with clear returns on investment um, that we can manage and make investments over the long term to continue this kind of process to, uh, to create uh, savings over the long term. And the third concept were capstone projects. Um, and this actually, this idea came from our faculty themselves who said, why don't we use some of the stimulus money to allow a senior faculty member to work on a project that literally to, to surrender our tenure. We will surrender our tenure immediately. You go out and hire a junior faculty on the general fund that we're, that, uh, that we're releasing up at a lower salary. The, the faculty, senior faculty member signs a contract for a two-year period to do a specific project for us that will leave, in essence, a legacy for the college. So, for example, um, one of our computer information systems professors developed an online adv ad advising program that reduced uh, the business advising hold from 60 hours to 30 hours. 
a 50, you know, 100 percent essentially reduction in the time it takes to, or a 50 percent reduction in the time it takes to get advising done for a business student. It also led to a change to add uh, general uh, studies level one courses as prerequisites for the business core. Another faculty member, um, as her capstone project, designed one of the master's programs in the field of addiction studies, which has now been implemented. So she has left, but we have an ongoing legacy of a new, of a new course within the master's program. So um, what is the current situation in Colorado? Well, um, as was mentioned earlier, um, we were taken back to our 2005 level. And this is where I want to begin to sort of talk about the disconnect between um, stated intent and, and of, of what we want our policy to do and the instruments that we use. Because that, what the feds essentially said to the state is that's your choice. You can reduce it back to 2005. So Colorado did that without regard to what had happened on enrollments at any institution between 2009 and 2005. So many institutions had had declines in enrollments. They got sent back to their 2005 level. Declines below their 2005 level, they actually got a benefit. My institution had a 10% increase in enrollment between 2005 and 2009. So we actually ended up fundamentally taking a bigger per student cut than anybody else. Uh, and when you think about the student body that we have, which is largely low income, uh, and the fact that all of our growth uh, since I have been here have been in students of color uh, who largely come from low-income families, who largely don't have histories in their family of, of either going to college or persistence in college, and so they're in need of additional uh, support. What we find is the very institutions where we ought to be making investments to achieve our stated public policy goals, we're actually disadvantaging compared to our research universities. So since 2008-9, our funding from the state has dropped by 20 percent. Uh, and if you actually took a look at our general fund per student today, um, in current dollars, not inflation adjusted dollars, in our current dollars, we're currently at the same place we were in 1983. We get roughly $2,000 a student from the state of Colorado. I tell people that today in Denver, if you're a parent with a young child, it costs you $1,100 a month for daycare. $1,100 per month. So what we're saying is that one year of, uh, of a baccalaureate degree is worth less than two months of daycare in the state of Colorado today, even though that baccalaureate degree will yield more than a million dollars in income over someone without that uh, degree. Since, um, since um, whoops, I'm going to go back. It's not in there. Since 2008-9, or I should say since the year 2000, the, the state share of uh, funding uh, and the tuition share has flipped. So in 2000, where it used to be 68% of the support, now I'm not putting in research, I'm not putting in auxiliary enterprise, I'm, not putting in, I'm just talking about the direct cost of education. The state in 2000 paid 68% of the cost of education today. Um, the student pays 68% of the cost of education. So next year, the general fund, this next year we anticipate we're going to have a general fund cut of approximately, um, oops, I, somehow I won't buy the place I want to be. There's the graph that we wanted to do. Next year we're going to have another general fund cut of about $1.6 million. Um, we won't know until the revenue projections come out in March about whether there will be additional reductions. But since the governor built his budget around an assumption that a um, homestead tax exemption, a tax benefit for the elderly, would not be funded, and the House, State House of Representatives, which are Republicans, want to fund it, um, it is highly likely that there will need to be another $100 million reduction in the budget. And people believe all of that will come out of the um, higher education. Um, and finally, related to higher education for Colorado, we are now one of those states that has had a lower court determination uh, in the federal courts that our uh, School Finance Act is uh, unconstitutional. Um, but unlike the other states um, that have had that determination, where their legislature could address the issue and make adjustments, because of Tabor, our legislature cannot make that determination. 
So this is where we get to what we think the future looks like. Uh, during the court case, it was projected that the shortfall in K-12 funding could be as much as $4 billion. Now, for those of you in New York, it might not seem like a lot of money, but since right now the entire K-12 funding for all of K-12 today is $6 billion, $4 billion is a pretty significant number. Um, we just had an election in November in which there was a ballot proposal for $500 million for just K-12 and higher education, $500 million one-eighth of the four billion. It was defeated 60% to 40%. So the likelihood, if, the, if this case prevails through the Supreme Court, the likelihood of the taxpayers running to the rescue of higher education are somewhere between slim and none, which gets back to this reality of if we want to deal with the kinds of students, um, what are we going to, how are we going to rethink our priorities? So we continue to have conversations uh, with the state of Colorado. We are moving uh, into another round of performance contracts. Those con performance contracts um, are built around um, four priorities in the master plan, increasing degree attainment, closing attainment gaps. And by the way, Colorado has the second highest attainment gap in the country between its majority population and its largest minority population, uh, the Latino population. Um, and we, um, we happen to have um, one in four of, of all Latinos in higher education in Colorado attend our institution. One in three of all African Americans in Colorado uh, attend our institution. 76% of our students are low income. Um, and 67% uh, of that population are Pell eligible. So it's not like we can uh, move down a strategy of we're just going to raise tuition because there is no cost shift that's going to occur. For us, the tuition strategy is not a viable long-term strategy. It is a short-term strategy which we have been using to try to make up for the reductions we've had in the, in the uh, short term. But for the long term, um, that is not going to be a viable strategy, which gets us back to why did we, why did we pick the strategies we did? Well, because our board has said we have to continue to maintain our mission, who we serve and what we serve. So they have said to me for the future that I need to create as many public-private projects as I can, create as many revenue streams as I can, which will continue our mission to serve largely low-income uh, students, uh, all Colorado students, out into the future. It is the exact opposite of our sister university, the University of Colorado, which up until two years ago had a requirement that 60% of their freshman class had to be Colorado residents. That meant already 40% were non-residents. Then they amended the statute to say, well, international students are excluded from the 40%. So they're recruiting every international student they can to cross-subsidize their students. I just told you I have 97% Coloradans. There is no cross-subsidy for me. So the question is, is how will public policy then, if it really is interested in low-income students, in historically underrepresented students, provide sufficient support to assure that they have an opportunity when we're at the low end of the funding stream? And when I say we, I'm really talking about, I think we're an example in general of community colleges and regional comprehensive institutions across the country, because that is where these populations of students are going to. The data is very clear. They are not going to the research universities. And so how are we going to change how we think about the execution of these instruments if you really want to achieve an outcome that's going to have those populations coming out? And you know, the interesting thing is, that the education gap between the rich and the poor is increasing. Many of you may have seen this recent article in the New York Times um, that has talked about that, um, that gap growing between uh, poor and rich students substantially over the last several years. So that's it. Be glad to respond to questions as a part of the panel. Just a few minutes here for questions. I mean, I had some prepared, but I'd love to give you all an opportunity to ask your questions instead. Um, Alex has 
the microphone here. So, yes. Yeah, this gentleman here in the suit. Hi there, President Jordan. All of you, uh, great presentations. I was curious, can you talk just a bit on the role of online education, the extent to which it's provided, the pressure to provide it, the cost, uh, you know, sure. how the business plan works in that regard? Sure. Um, first of all, obviously, um, every legislator thinks that's the uh, panacea for reducing costs. Um, what we have found in our institution, right now, uh, every semester, one in four of our students is taking an online course an online course. And in almost every case, it is a convenience question for them, because almost all of our students are working, um, and average age of about 26. So for us, we have focused most of our efforts around courses, not around degree programs. Um, and, and in particular, as we have done that, what we have found in terms of our efforts around retention is that we have found that um, doing um, blended courses where um, where it's one week actually face-to-face -face, and the next week uh, by distance actually has resulted in better retention uh, and overall uh, um, graduation rates to, uh, towards us. So um, almost, I would say probably 70% of the courses that we're developing now uh, in that area are blended courses instead of going to pure 100% distance delivered courses. Um, hi, my question is for um, Mr. Lingenfelter. I just wanted to follow up on your um, comments about Pell Grants. Um, I'm wondering what you see as the more positive public policy reasons for them and some of the things that you alluded to. I'm curious what you think are the, the less good reasons for them. We have, um, <clears throat> as Steve, I think, very eloquently demonstrated, we are not putting our resources behind our top priorities in a variety of ways. Um, I think um, certainly the shift uh, toward merit aid uh, does not have very much educational uh, return. Uh, the problem in Pell Grants, I think, is we have developed, particularly in community colleges, a delivery system that sort of emphasizes um, uh, episodic part-time enrollment uh, I think in the most egregious cases, we, uh, we have people who have real financial needs uh, who are using Pell Grants to pay living expenses and not making educational progress. And we need to restructure the way we deliver education uh, and provide enough support so students can actually enroll in a program and complete it in a reasonable period of time. So we have much better retention and uh, graduation rates. And then we have, because of uh, distance education opportunities, a substantial amount of indiscipline about quality assurance. And I think um, <clears throat> you don't have much more than anecdotal evidence, but uh, I'm pretty sure where there's smoke, there's fire, uh, that we're getting a substantial amount of unproductive uh, Pell Grant expenditures for students who are being exploited and are uh, uh, absorbing debt that they will not be able to pay. And this is, these are all uh, both uh, socially and economically misguided public policies. My name is Lee Yang. Uh, I suppose this kind of federal subsidies uh, is not going to work. So far as I know, there's no uh, really addressing the problem. Let's say abuse, how to trim the abuse or the fraud, and how do you encourage students to go to the higher education because a lot of PhD now is doing a janitor work. And uh, a lot of con government contractors get higher pay than PhD, so there's no point. And uh, if you are thinking of public-private uh, partnership, that type of things, uh, currently uh, like probably social workers or uh, health assistant, that type of things, it seems uh, increasing the employment. But the problem now is those employment are being hired to do the wrong things to injure the patients or abuse and uh, 
conspiracy of fraudulent criminal network to hurt people's family. And if we are thinking about uh, criminal justice system, their family resources are the ripping away rather than have an educational nourishing environment. So the, the federal budget didn't address this type of need. Ma'am, can we cut you off there? I, I think we get the, so the question it seems to me is about uh, how do we encourage people to go, to continue to see the benefit of a, a higher education in this less than optimal economy? So what is the federal role in that? Yeah. I, I think um, I want to respond to the question of the, the relationship of education to the workforce. Um, yeah, 35, 40 years ago when I was finishing graduate school, 70% of the people working in this country had a high school diploma or less. And uh, that was about 66 million jobs. Uh, by 2007, we had 69 million jobs for high school diploma or less. But we had 155 million jobs overall. So all of the, all of the growth in the workforce in, uh, in my professional career has been in jobs uh, that have uh, some post-secondary education and substantial growth in jobs that have uh, a, a, bachelor's, a bachelor's degree or higher. And the economic returns to education have been enormous in that period of time. Uh, so we need federal policy that really invests in human talent and in uh, developing people's potential. And I don't think there's any other, any other uh, uh, economic strategy that uh, will have those kind of dividends. I would make one comment about um, some changes in federal policy that I think could, could help. For example, um, I think many of you are probably familiar with the concept of the Hispanic serving institutions, historically black colleges and universities, Native American serving institutions. And the general criteria is that 25% of your undergraduate enrollment has to be from that ethnic population. So, so you know, that works really great if you're an institution of, say, 2,000 students and you have 500 Latinos. Um, but if you're, if you're an institution of 2,000 and you have less students today than you had 40 years ago and you still have the same 500 students, but you're getting a federal grant as an HSI and you're eligible for, for other grants, how is that actually helping to achieve policy? An institution like mine, we've increased by 3,000, or excuse me, by, by 2,000 Latinos uh, in the last five years. Uh, and we've moved from 13% to 18%. We've increased our uh, African-American population by 12%. But we get no assistance to help us to graduate those students or move them forward. So the real question ought to be is how should federal policy be addressed for in institutions that demonstrate that for three consecutive years or some time period that they have continued sustained growth in both numbers of students in these targeted populations and in retention and graduation rates. Seems to me a policy that did that kind of uh, in, um, incentive to institutions would result in a much more positive outcome than simply saying if you're at a flat percentage then we're going to give you a grant. Uh, do we have time for one more question? I know folks have planes to catch and such. We good for one more? Great. Uh, the gentleman in the yellow shirt there. May have been a mistake. In any case, um, Fred Winter, U.S. Department of Education. Um, Dr. Jordan, we can talk if you've got a moment about the HSI and the HBCU programs. I'd love to have that conversation with you. Um, the president has made as the centerpieces of his higher education agenda, college completion, increasing the rates of completion in the United States, and reduction in college cost. Um, considering what we heard today, I welcome your comments about how the cost reduction initiative might be best operationalized on the federal level. Well, um, you saw that um, I think we were an example of someone who, given the opportunity for a specified period of time to take a, a, a source of money and use it to leverage um, different ways to do business with the same or fewer people, I think we came up with some creative ideas. One of the most difficult things that we had in that process was, um, um, as, as you mentioned, the, our state kept changing our distribution of, 
of uh, our ARA money and, and the state money uh, at, over the two-year period. And when you've set up like three programs like we did with discrete budgets and you made commitments and people keep changing your sources of funds, it makes it very difficult to manage those processes. But I think creating sources of funds that incentivize institutions to go about thinking about these creative kinds of ideas to self-generate more money or to be more efficient or more effective could be very helpful. I, it's been, it was very helpful to us. You know, if you look at the, um, if you look at the trend in total educational spending on the charts that I showed, uh, you see cost reductions, <laughs> and uh, you don't see much cost growth, particularly in the in the public sector. Uh, part of the problem in the national dialogue about uh, cost reductions is that people talk about percentage increases on public tuitions that you know have have doubled in the last 25 years in real dollars, but they've doubled from 2,000 to 4,000 or 4,500. Uh, and we have a range of educational expenditures per student that go from, in Steve's case, about $5,000 a student to $50,000 per student and more. <laughs> uh, and so our problem as a nation is that we spend uh, extravagantly on the education of the most able, frankly, <laughs> and uh, stingily on the education of those who uh, need the most assistance. Now, we're not going to get everybody educated to exactly the same level, but we've got uh, an enormous challenge to get our workforce to a level of capacity and our citizenry to a level of capacity to cope with the 21st century. And in order to do that, we're going to have to put more money into the education of students that need extra support, either financial or academic support, in order to succeed. And uh, it, it's not, you know, I mean, sure there are ways that we can uh, become more efficient. Uh, we need to become more focused in the way we organize academic programs. Uh, we need to uh, become more disciplined about the way we guide students through a curriculum. Uh, we need to do some of the things, things Steve has done. Um, but the big problem is not cost reduction. The big problem is resource allocation, in my view. Well, I think that just about wraps it up. I'd like to thank all of our speakers for coming out today, too, especially who flew long distances to be here. Um, if anyone has questions they'd like to ask, hopefully some people can stick around for a few minutes. Otherwise, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and please check out, we'll be posting the video online if you want to go back and make sure you got something uh, exactly as it was worded. And uh, we've been live tweeting the event, too, if you want to join us on the Twitter discussion as well. Thank you.